Kal halal yum la yahu bashem yaushai, bashem rechaha kurash. Double honors to the apostles of GMS, the Ruwal, who I learned this truth from. And salutations and blessings unto you elect out there, you uh, brothers and few sisters that take heed in sincerity and in truth. All right. Um, yeah, coming back with a history lesson. Um, this is just going to deal with um, uh, during World War One, where um, you had the so-called, here they say the American Indian in the Great War, right, real and imagined by Diane Cameron, all right, you can type this in Google and find this uh, website article, um, <clears throat> and this is going into basically how Gad, or who, who, who are known as the American Indians, or North American Indians, right, they're the tribe of Gad, one of the, one of the sons of Jacob, all right, the prince of the power, all right, you guys are Israelites, and how during World War I, they were very fierce, and they terrified the Germans. You know, so this is going into a bit of the history. So let's start. <clears throat> let's see. One second. Because this is going into prophet, uh, prophecy, um, history, uh, understanding, Right. Uh, this is not some some folklore or or legends, you know. So it says there are nu there are numerous stories of Indian heroism during the Great War, and most of them recalled that Indians were born warriors. War seems the natural business of the Indian. In this process, German and Indian soldiers were often put in the same category of savages, though of course Indians were always the good savages. In November 1918, an article began, and that's the whole thing, right, where they um they don't they don't deem you as a man. Right? That's why in the um in the American uh what is that constitution, right? Or the uh, Declaration of Independence, right? In the in in the fine print when you can look it up, right? They they call Negroes, uh, three fourths of a human being, or something like that, right? Three fourths or one fourth, and then they call it, um, American Indians savages. So basically, they're they're letting you know that these laws they don't apply to you. You're not a human, you know. They don't deem you as a human. When you look up the word uh, "human" in the uh, Black's Law Dictionary, which is a very prestigious law dictionary, it'll actually tell you to look up "monster." And when you look up monster, it basically says a person that has no entitlement, they have no sovereignty, you know, they, they can't own anything. And that's where we're headed to this day, right? With uh, the, the, great, the, the Great Reset, okay? <laughs> Klaus, Klaus Devils, uh, Devil Schwab said, right? That says, um, In November 1918, an article began with this evocative sentence. It was the Prussian guard against the American Indian on the morning of October 8th in the hills of Champagne. Nearly all articles also emphasized that if the methods that Indians used in fighting were the traditional savage ones, their ideals, on the contrary, were highly civilized. Or maybe it would be better to say that through their combat against them, an enemy more savage than the red man, they acquired the basics of civilization. And after all, even their methods were not that savage. A chief, Don White Eagle, pointed out, to be tomahawked cleanly is a much easier way to die than lots of the German methods of warfare. You know, and I want to take again another point that, look, what did they say up here? War seems to be the natural business of the Indian. Now, Gad, right? This is a thing that you hear brothers say often. The three, uh, the three so-called warrior tribes of the, of the nation of Israel. Now, all Israel, they do their thing. They were all warriors. We're all warriors. Um, you know, we all fought in the war, in different wars. We were all mighty men. We got, we all had mighty men in each tribe. It's not like one tribe is better than the other. But you had three specific tribes that the Most High put a spirit on, right? 
and I'm going to get that uh, here. This is Second Chronicle or First Chronicle five and eighteen. The sons of Reuben. Who's Reuben? Today they're known as the Seminole Indians, right? Which Seminole is a byword, which means uh, I believe it means runaway, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, but uh, they were the uh, they they are known as the unconquered tribe because they 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 technically never ceded territory, but at the same time you were conquered, you know. But you were the firstborn, so you have that spirit, you know. Reuben was the firstborn of of Jacob, so he has that spirit, man. Right, they're very fierce. The Seminole War Indians, they were the fiercest man. They were they had the hardest time. I think they had three or four Seminole and US wars. Okay, wars, not battles, not skirmishes, wars. Okay, so the sons of Reuben and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh, right? Because when you look or you go into the, into the history, why why does it say half? Because you had uh two sides to Manasseh, right? Uh, in the in the ancient map, when you look it up, you you have uh, uh, two territories. You have east and 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 uh, east and west, if I'm not mistaken. That's how it's divided. But there is a division there. And Manasseh is who? Manasseh is the so-called Cubans today. And Cubans, they're very warlike. They're very athletic. They're very mighty. Okay, if you ever grew up, I grew up with a Cuban. You know that dude. He was like a ninja. Not, I'm not even bullshitting you. You know. Like we we did we did a lot of crazy shit, man. This dude, we did a lot of things, man. You know, but this dude was like a ninja, <laughs> you know. But Cubans are very athletic. That's why even in um in boxing, uh, uh, Mayweather he made news when he was in the amateurs because he was the first American to beat a Cuban, I believe, in the Olympics. For a lot of years, a lot of decades, you know. So that's Judah even fighting against uh, Manasseh, you know, but um. Yeah, Cubans do the thing, man. They do they do they do wrestling, they do uh, boxing. If they get into martial arts, they they fuck it up. Cubans are uh, are very warlike, right? So it says the sons of Reuben and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh, of valiant men, men able to bear buckler and sword and to shoot with the bow and skillful in war. See? So it mentions those three tribes. So that's why when you hear brothers say the three warrior tribes so called it's not a knock on any, any any other tribe. It's, we're just talking about this scripture here because when you go into history, whether it's uh, a recent history or ancient history, these three tribes really did stand out in, in some ways, right? Skillful in war were 40 and four, uh, were four and 40,703 score that went out to the war. Okay, so back to the article. Let's see. I'm going to jump around because I didn't uh, highlight Salakia, but I wanted to uh, actually get a, a, there's a journal reading of a, of, of a German, and uh, hey man, these Gadites back then, and that shows you that, that they're the sons of the Most High, man. They terrorized them, man, they, they, they struck the fear of God into them, okay, one sec, God, and Salakia brothers, I got a phone call um anyway back here i found the part um it was often reported that german soldiers of whom had grown up reading the many books of carl may were scared at the idea that redskins were fighting against them right and they call them redskins that's another byword that's another fit for prophecy because there is nothing about uh nothing read about uh gadites you know that's uh that's a term that they used, um, whether it be for the face paint that they used, you know, or um, or or the or the scalping, you know, but you know that that's another tactic that this devil used because that was the guy, um, uh, Blumenbach, forget his first name, the German, Blumenbach, who uh, in in the sixteen or fifteen hundreds. He uh, divided mankind into five five colors, basically, you know. Um, anyway, it says, This idea, or this might have been partly true, but of course, such an idea was extensively exploited by newspapers as a real find in popular folklore. Here is what the Stars and Stripes reported in May 1919. 
Uh, it says, quote, an American officer captured by the Germans in the Battle of St. Mihiel was surprised to find himself interrogated not on his division movements or objectives, but on how many Indians there were in the units opposing the bulks in that sector. This and, other, this and another incident in which it became known that an extra force of snipers had been put into the, into the lines to become or to come with the American Aborigines showed to what extent the Indians were feared by the Germans, you know, and that's a spiritual thing, man, right? There was one uh, Gadai from um, Canada, I forget his name, but in World War I, he was the top sniper, man, and I think his record still hasn't been beaten. He had over two or three hundred confirmed kills, man. You know, so these were, um, you know, as they said uh, uh, in another in another uh, quote, someone said that they're a martial race or, or they're a warlike race. But that's not all they are, because on the other side, the Mosai uh, made them actually like priests, you know, in, in a way to keep the laws and to be lawgivers, actually. You know, so there's a spiritual medicine side, like a medicine man. But then there's a warrior in them, you know. Um, it says, let me see. Down here in a preceding article from the same newspaper, the journalist reported that, quote, when the end of the fight opposing American Indian and German soldiers was nearing, Prussian guards could be seen running. Now, these are Germans. Could be seen running over the hilltops, casting away their rifles, knapsacks, canteens, Sacrificing everything for speed. Right? And they did that because why? They don't... I'm, I'm not sure why they don't quote it here. But basically they seen smoke signals. Uh, yeah, they seen smoke signals. And and they heard... Uh, 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 well, well, at night, Slakia, the quote is this, right? I got, I got it right here. All right, this is from a, a video, and I, and I captured this quote, and this made me go into this lesson to, to dig up this stuff. But this isn't where I, where I only seen it from. I seen it from somewhere else, but I didn't save it. Um, but this is someone, someone said this in, in the first quote up here, the comment on YouTube, right? In the First World War, Germans feared the natives. There was one journal of a German soldier found in battle ruins not so many years ago the germans wrote that his company saw the natives from canada coming towards them that was the last page that was written on the journal you know and you had this edomite dylan <laughs> what are you talking about and then someone replied he said he's talking about the lakota and creek and the crow people that fought the germans in world war one the germans wrote that during the day they could see rising smoke signals from the allied side but did not know what it meant. That night, they heard drums and the most hideous screaming and yelling and chants and whoops. It was the war dance. An hour later, the tribes attacked with arrows and tomahawks. Out of 400 Germans, just three survived by hiding. They said they saw Indians in feathers and full war paint using knives to take the scalps off of the Germans while they were still alive. And then holding them up and screaming, you know, and 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 that's the spirit. I mean, I mean that's um, you know, that's that's through the spirit. You gotta understand that these are warlike people, man. That's that goes straight into the scriptures, man. All right. Now I'm gonna go here. This is another article I had, but first let me get that point. Actually, I mentioned Gad. This is uh, no, not that. Deuteronomy 33 and 20. And of Gad he said, Blessed be he that enlargeth Gad. He dwelleth as a lion. Right? And teareth the arm with the crown of the head. You know, and Gad, Gad's uh, territory is very, very big, man. It's huge. And if you know about a lion, they, that's why you have the quote, two lions can't dwell, or two males, two kings can't dwell in the same, in the, in the same den, in the same lion's den. You have one man for the family. And guess what? That that territory is a large territory. You ever seen a lion run? And then he has his, his woman, then he has his cubs. He has his hunting grounds. He has his water uh, territory where, where he drinks his water. He has his shade. They need a lot of territory, man. So Gad was very, they had plush. They had a lot of land, right? 
and he verse, 20, uh, verse 21 and he provided the first part of for himself because there there in a portion of the lawgiver was he seated right and that's why you have that folklore and and and, and you know Esau makes fun of it oh the the, the medicine man and oh what are you gonna uh you know are you gonna make it rain are you gonna do a rain dance are you gonna do this are you gonna you know they make fun of it but men receive visions men use medicine you know men certain men had certain powers certain men you know they, they did certain things man extraordinary extraordinary things but they were a portion of a lawgiver so when they came here it says uh, uh in the in the second ezra 13 it says they came here to keep the laws which they did for a certain time and certain tribes fell away and then the rest is history you know you can read about it right um it says, was he seated and he came with the heads of the people. He executed the justice of the Lord Yahweh and his judgments with Israel. You know, and then one more in the book of First uh, Chronicle 12 and 8. And of the Gadites, there separated themselves unto David into the hold to the wilderness. Men of might and men of war fit for the battle. That could handle shield and buckler, whose faces were like the faces of lions, and were as swift as the roes upon the mountains, which uh, roes is like a deer, but you have different you know different kinds. But you see a deer hopping, it's quick, and then it and then it uh, it hops up, man, it jumps up very high, a gazelle, that would be a better, you know, they jump up high as hell, man, and they're very light in their feet and they're swift. All right. And they're agile, they can turn very quickly, but the point is they're very fierce, man, like a lion. The faces of a lion, they're very fierce. <laughs> Why do you think the Germans were running for their lives? And listen, man, Germans, they're not no, oh, well, nah, there's some, oh, ah. <laughs> you ever watch them Hitler uh, speeches, man? Listen, them Germans are very rough. They're tall, you know. They're, uh, 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 they're, they're, they're not pushovers, man. They're very um, industrious. It, it, they're, they're the wise men of Timon, right? But they're not no pushovers, man. They're um they're very um. I'll say, stern, you know, mean even, you know, they're not like uh, they're not like Swedish or Nor Norwish, no, uh, <laughs> them kind of Edomites, you know, which they claim they're Vikings. Get the get the fuck out of here, get the fuck out of here. Anyway, let's go here. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go here. This is 1914 and 1918 online. International Encyclopedia of the First World War. Indigenous Experiences of War. Okay. So motivation for service. I'm going to skim through this. Indigenous military service is a complex narrative of loyalties, influences, and motivations. Westerners have frequently and falsely read Indigenous participation in the military is an attempt to legitimize themselves in the eyes of dominant society as American citizens. American elites eagerly recruited Native Americans into military services because they considered them a martial race. Martial means war. All right. So very warlike race. And what did we just read in those scriptures in the Chronicles, in the first and second Chronicles, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy? They're very fierce. They're fit for the battle. Okay? Uh, martial race into dominant society. Now let's go down. Check this out right down here. It says Native Americans participated in each military conflict. From the American Revolutionary War to the American Civil War. In 1866, the Army Reorganization Act regularize the use of indigenous scouts and auxiliaries and you can look this up you have a lot of, like you have the war of um what is that shit called uh i used to go into this history all the time the well, you had the french and the british fighting like in canada because the french when you look up when you when you check out you know colonization the french went more deeper and faster into America and Canada, they went more west faster. Okay, they they act they actually have more territory. But the British came and they were the that that was the done, you know the so to speak that was the done. The British came. The French were already way west, 
you know. But you had the um, the British fight the French, and then the British won in Canada, and that's why you have even Quebec. They let them be, you know, French and whatnot. And they they want to be the uh, even a, a, a separate country or province or whatever. But um, guess what? When you look up all those wars, right? The War of eighteen, what is that, sixteen or something like that? When you look up all those wars, you'll see the French fighting the British, but then you'll see the allies of the French and the allies of the British, and, and it's all different Yadai tribes, right? They were all helping the enemy, and that was part of our downfall. That was all part of prophecy. It couldn't have happened any other way. It couldn't, a damn sure couldn't have happened just by Esau rolling up, because although he is a sword, you know, we, we talk about the sword, and yes, there's mighty men of Esau that can fight. They're crazy. They're, they're, they're strong. They can fight. They got skills, but that's not Esau. He's not a, he's not a real warrior. He's a he's a he's a deceiver. He's a devil. He's he's meant to deceive. So many things that he did was employ this tribe against that tribe, you know, and he did it in so many multifaceted ways. He would give you blankets with smallpox, bio warfare. You know, he would mess you up in the mine, he'd take your kids off to boarding school, he would kill your food supply, your buffalo that you that you depend upon. He would pollute your water so you can't fish there anymore. All these different methods, man makes him that top warrior of, of really deception, you know, a top devil, right? These the Gadites were noble. They were real noble people, right? But we went off. We all went off, man. And good for us because we we strayed from the laws, statutes, and commandments of Yahweh Hashem Yahweh Shai. So good for us that we went off or or uh, um, that, that we got judged, Salaki, now that we went off. But it was all prophecy, man. Like I said, it's all prophecy, um, from the 1860s through to the 1890s, in indigenous scouts and auxiliaries played a crucial role in military campaigning and the subjugation of the remaining tribal nations in the West. The national debate about whether to integrate indigenous soldiers into the United States military held between 1891 and 1918 was a debate over federal Indian policy between assimilationists and, pres and preservationists. Assimilationists were convinced that Native Americans were a vanishing race due to expropriation and subjugation, military defeat, land loss, removal, and so on. Accordingly, the only pathway to survival and avoiding extinction was through citizenship, education, and allotment. The breaking up of tribal lands into individual parcels. Preservationists likewise considered assimil assimilation inevitable but hoped to preserve what was left of the culture of what they had considered an ultimately doomed people through picture, audio, and camera. The issue of integrating or segregating indigenous soldiers into the regular United States Army falls into the larger context of this discussion. In 1891, military officials introduced indigenous men into the regular army. The idea was to provide indigenous men, particularly boarding school graduates with employment and that whole boarding school system right they they just want to claim that it was about oh saving the saving the, the man killing the indian and assimilation and not nah, there was a bunch of madness you guys are a bunch of pedophiles you guys are a bunch of perverts all right sodomites a bunch of to uh, torturous you know rageful devils man and you're gonna get double for for what you have done okay you're going to get double because across Canada and America, right? And you have these different chapels in, in South America and Central America for, through the dirty conquistadors as well. You know, they had their version of the boarding schools. But across Canada and America, if you study what happened in those boarding schools, in, in Canada we call them residential schools, same shit, right? Like I said, there was a bunch of uh, 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 killing, pedophilia, um abuse you know torture and the ones that survived they were pretty much scarred they were traumatized and they were scarred for the rest of their life you know so that's that's something that you devils are gonna really pay for too okay um let's see let's go down during world war one the debate over integrating or segregating indigenous soldiers resurfaced once again and was argued through the press, congressional hearings, and public addresses. 
the because they know, man, they know you're warriors. They're the top people. They need you. Why? why if you're a vanishing, doomed, drunk, uh, uh, um, tomahawk, Indian, redskin, whatever on the reservation, why the fuck do we need you in the army? No, they know that you're the top people, man. That yes, it was manifest destiny. We were. We knew that it was our time to rule. We took you over. But listen, we need you right now. We need, we need your service. We need the niggas. We need the Indians. We need the Spicks. We need you guys, man. Okay, because you guys are God's people. They know that. They know that. The top of them know that. What I'm saying sounds crazy to you sheeple, but the top, you Edomites, you know what the hell's going on, man. Or else why would you take a vanishing doomed race that you just want to exterminate anyway? Okay. <laughs> To uh to enlist, so it says. Whereas all indigenous males of that age were required to register for the draft, only roughly a third held the United States citizenship, despite their legal status as non-citizens. Ain't that some shit? Many indigenous draftees waived their right to apply for an exemption from military services or service. Government figures indicate that by the end of September 1918, a total of 17,313 indigenous men had registered for the draft, and of these, 6,509 were inducted, a number representing roughly 13% 13 of adult indigenous population. This number, however, does not include voluntary enlistment. Apparently, the ratio of volunteers was significantly higher. Okay, so this is, again, just going through the details. So it says indigenous soldiers fought in every branch of service, yet the overwhelming select you right here. Though yet the overwhelming majority served in the army in infantry units. A, a small number of veterans also enlisted in the armies of other nations, such as Canada, Britain, and France, before America's entrance into the war in 1917. At the front lines, indigenous soldiers frequently found themselves as scouts to survey territory, snipers to patrol the front, or runners to carry messengers, messengers as Germans were renowned for intercepting telephone communications. The exposure to risk in these front line duties was reflected in the high casualty rate of indigenous servicemen as a direct result of their service, an estimated 5% of all indigenous servicemen died in action as compared to 1% of their non-indigenous counterparts right so look at this the, I, I just want to read this part as well Native Americans made significant contributions on the home front they bought about 25 million dollars worth of war bonds and about 10,000 Native Americans joined the Red Cross, wrapping bandages, bandages, knitting and collecting clothing for those in need on the Western Front. Indigenous women in particular supported the war effort. So without the tribes, you devils wouldn't have anything, man. This is only one tribe. You know, you had Judah as well back then. Uh, 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 you had Reuben, Issachar, you know. That's that man without without the tribes you devils would have nothing man. Okay. Um manifold the uh, supported the war effort through manifold activities such as buying war bonds, donating to the Red Cross or working in war related industries such as shipyards, aircraft plants or weapons and ammunition factories. The extraordinary service re record of Native Americans dur during World War 1 attracted considerable media attention. The media portrayed indigenous military service in ways that gave a credence to the legitimacy of the American war effort and the superiority of the United States military. Stereotypical news media accounts invoked the image of brave warriors fighting for democracy and against German tyranny. We, uh, we read that in the other part, the martial race again, right? That was it. And then when you got home, <laughs> I mean, we already know, but let, let, let's read it, right? Post-war discrimination. Right, but hold on. Let's lock you. One second. Here, it says, apparently much of the fear and respect instilled in German 
soldiers stemmed from the fanciful novels of Karl May, a German writer of the late 19th century. In his novels, May established indigenous warriors as both noble and ennoble, frequently extolling their supposed propensities for scouting, hunting, tracking, and fighting. Apparently, German soldiers harbored conflicting notions when encountering their former childhood heroes, this time as enemies on the battlefield. You know, so again, just showing you men of renown, great people, right? Great men, but still under the curses, right? Indigenous participation in the Great War did not mean an end to government paternalism, nor did it halt racial discrimination or settler colonial infringement upon indigenous lands and resources. For example, many, many Native Americans were unsuccessful in redeeming liberty bonds on the grounds that indigenous purchasers were declared incompetent. Many indigenous veterans returned to impoverished reservation communities with high rates of unemployment, poor health, disenfranchisement, and illiteracy. Despite the substantial contribution of Native Americans to the war effort, the federal government often only extended symbolic gestures to express their gratitude but provided no substantial aid in curbing reservation problems such as unemployment. All right. So I hope you're edified with that. I want to say Kahalalim, Layhawa Bashem Yaushai, Bashem Racha Hakurash, double honors to the apostles of GMS, Darubal, who I learned this truth from, and uh, salutations and blessings to you elect out there, brothers in uh, Akim and Fu Akwathium. Shalom.